From one LEGO app that was a complete failure, to a mistake that cost the company millions. These are the biggest LEGO mistakes of all time, starting with the horrible LEGO Scala set. The LEGO Scala series popped up briefly between 1979 and 1980, featuring cool jewelry sets with interchangeable decoration. Then in 1997, LEGO launched another girl-focused series alongside Belleville. Scala had slightly larger dolls that could wear full outfits, taking inspiration from the ever-popular Barbie dolls. They even redesigned some parts just for Scala. The main themes revolved around doll houses and accessories, but sadly, Scala struggled to find its place between LEGO Belleville and Mattel's Barbie, leading to its end in 2001. The main reason for its early end is that LEGO Scala didn't look and feel like LEGO. I mean, the whole point of LEGO is the LEGO system, where every piece fits together. But with Scala, it just felt like a rebel against the norm. But one thing that kept Scala linked to LEGO was that it included some LEGO bricks in the playsets. But from 97 to 98, those brick studs were in flower shapes, which made them incompatible with other LEGO sets. But as horrible as the LEGO Scala set already was, they managed to make things worse by releasing the LEGO Scala Summer Day Out set in 1998. This one has a baby in a carriage that looks a little creepy, along with a Dalmatian that seems much larger than the baby. They also come with an umbrella, a teddy bear, and a picnic setup. What really stands out here is the size of the dog and the baby's unusual look. Honestly, I'm pretty sure the baby named Thomas could hop out of that carriage and ride the dog home if he wanted. And the baby's eyes just keep staring at you like he's trying to peek into your soul. It's so weird and and LEGO made a huge mistake onboarding it. But even worse than the LEGO Scala was LEGO Gladiator. You've probably heard of Galador, right? If so, you've probably been told that it was bad, awful, or even not a real construction toy. And well, people aren't wrong. But what made Galador such a flop? After all, it was a construction toy, and those have done pretty well in the past. So let's find out what went wrong. First, let's rewind to 2002, where LEGO wanted to create a toy line with a TV show, kind of like what other companies had been doing for years. So they chose was a kids TV show of the same name. The story was about a teenager named Nick Bluetooth and his friend Allegra, who got zapped into an alien dimension. They're tasked with helping a bunch of aliens stop the evil Gorm from taking over the galaxy. Sounds exciting, right? Well, it wasn't. Now, I'm no Galador expert, but after watching two episodes, I couldn't handle any more. The show was slow with barely any humor, while something like Ninjago Masters of Spinjitsu kicked off with tons of action and laughs, keeping the fun going. It's a shame the Galador TV show flogged because the basic story wasn't that bad. It had some cool ideas like Nick finding out his dad might have been in the alien dimension before him and could still be out there somewhere. That's a pretty solid backstory, but the show just wasn't interesting enough to keep kids watching. Similar to the TV show, the LEGO theme bombed so badly that some sets were sold at 90% off. The funny thing is that Galador was actually LEGO's first full TV show for one of their toy themes. It was also their last for a while because LEGO clearly got a big cautious after the Galador disaster. Now, let's talk about Galador's biggest problem. It really wasn't a building toy. The whole build part was just swapping arms, legs, and heads between the figures. That's it. I mean, how does that compare to other construction themes, you ask? Well, let's take a look at Bionicle and Knight's Kingdom. With Bionicle, you could combine different models into larger, cooler creations, and each part had at least two connection points. You could even use Bionicle parts with Technic pieces to build even bigger things, like Makuta or the Exotoa. Galador, on the other hand, only had one connection point per part, and those parts only worked with the Galador system. Knight's Kingdom 2 wasn't perfect either. The hands could only be hands, the feet could only be feet, and the figures weren't very customizable. But at least most parts had studs or Technic connectors, so you could use them to build other models. In fact, the basic joint parts from Knight's Kingdom 2 ended up being used to make mechs for years. So, while Galador wasn't all bad, it had two huge problems. No real building, and a boring TV show. If it had used more Lego-like building pieces and added a few jokes into the show, it might have stuck around for a few years. Now, weird and funny Lego sets aren't the only mistakes the company has made over the years. Lego has also tried experimenting with different Lego designs and business ventures to keep the ball rolling. But while some have been a hit, just like Lego Star Wars game franchise, some have also just not gotten there yet. Like the famous Legoland, which is famous for the wrong reasons. If you didn't know, Legoland is a super fun theme park packed with awesome stuff to do. You can shop, find a place to stay, and check out amazing LEGO creations while riding on cool LEGO themed rides. It all started way back in 1968 in Billund, Denmark, where the LEGO headquarters is located. The founder's son showcased some fantastic
plastic Lego builds in glass displays outside the factory. And over time, people came to see the Lego masterpieces making the company open its very first mini theme park. Fast forward to a couple of decades later, and these mini parks have become full-sized resorts found all over the world. From Britain to Germany, the United States, Malaysia, the UAE, Japan, and even South Korea. At some point, Lego theme parks were thought to be the next big thing after Disneyland. But knowing what we know now, it's clear that these Lego parks were overvalued. Legoland has faced several challenges that have significantly impacted its success. While the concept of Lego themed attractions sounded promising, the execution often fell short. Many parks struggle with attracting enough visitors, leading to disappointing attendance figures. Some parks like Legoland California faced intense competition from larger, more established amusement parks, which offered a wider range of attractions. Additionally, the initial investment in Lego resorts was significant, but the return on investment was slow. Many parks also suffered from operational issues, including high maintenance costs for attractions and facilities. Some locations like Legoland Florida have experienced significant weather-related challenges, affecting their ability to operate year-round. Therefore, the parks often relied heavily on the Lego brand's popularity, but failed to innovate beyond their established offerings. And according to reviews, the experience sometimes feels repetitive, leading to a lack of excitement for returning visitors. As a result, several parks such as Legoland Windsor saw closures or scaled back operations. Multiple articles across the net also give a no-no for anyone considering an experience at Legoland. While some Legoland parks are still active in 2024, this next Lego mistake was sent packing in 2021. The Lego Video App now, whether you think this was a mistake or not, the real mistake wasn't the app itself, but the company deciding to cut its development short. Talk about a premature farewell. Launched in January 2021, LEGO Video had a rocky start right from day one. The first wave of beatboxes came with just one minifigure, a few printed tiles, and some single-use molds for a jaw-dropping 20 bucks. It was so pricey that third-party sellers were practically giving them away with a 33% discount. Seeing discounts on launch day is about as rare as finding a unicorn in a LEGO set, and Yes, that is really rare. This made everyone raise their eyebrows, especially since Lego.com still sold them at full price, making the value look even worse. The 43101 bandmates with their blind box packaging didn't do any better, costing more than regular collectible minifigures. But wait, there's more. The video app, which is basically the whole point of the theme, was a major flop too. Users quickly took to the app stores, leaving one and two star reviews that slammed it for being slow and crash happy. Imagine trying to make a music video and your app decides to take a nap. And to top it off, the app kept everything behind its own locked door. You could create awesome music videos, but good luck sharing them with your friends unless they were on the app's super controlled feed. Sure, it kept kids safe, but it also hit so many geniuses from the world. When the second wave of sets came out, they at least offered a more enjoyable building experience. But with the app still underwhelming, it felt like video's time was already up. It's a total contrast to LEGO Hidden Side which had an augmented reality feature but still managed to get three full waves before being shelled by LEGO. The big difference? Hidden Side's app added a little spice to everyone's fun builds, while videos seemed to rely way too much on digital bells and whistles, leaving its beatboxes and bandmates feeling a bit, well, flat. When you think of the LEGO group's biggest mistakes, the quality of their bricks probably isn't the first thing that comes to mind. After all, LEGO was famous for its high quality standards, but back in 2010, some sneaky mistakes slipped past quality control, and unfortunately that's when the Brittle Brick set was being produced, especially the famous Brittle Brown. Brittle Brown is what fans like to call the most famous fragile of the set, though other colors were also victims of the brittleness. These fragile colors stuck around for most of the 2010s, and boy were they sensitive. Just the slightest movement or even a gentle touch, and snap crack boom, the pieces would break. Okay, maybe a bit of exaggeration, but honestly not by much. The dyes used to create these colors made them much more likely to break when connecting them with or pulling them apart from other pieces. And well, connecting and separating Lego bricks is kind of their whole thing, right? Now, if these pieces only snapped when you treated them roughly or kept them in a super hot place, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. It's normal to expect some wear and tear under extreme conditions, but nope. These bricks had a habit of breaking even when they were in perfect shape, just sitting in official sets or custom models. Even if they were safe safely stored in cool comfy places, these dark brown and red bricks could still crack. Trying to take a brown plate off a base plate, even with a special brick separator tool, chances are the brown plate would break and disassembling a set to store it meant saying goodbye to the pieces. Even the beloved LEGO Mini
minifigures weren't safe. They're usually together since you don't take them apart as often, but if a minifigure had a brown torso and fell off a shelf onto the floor, it might shatter. This meant that some of LEGO's coolest sets from the 2010s, like the awesome 9474 Helms Deep and the 75059 Sandcrawler, ended up being super fragile. LEGO eventually realized the issue, and to their credit, they fixed it around 2019. They tweaked the dyes used in these fragile colors, making the bricks in newer sets much sturdier. Also, LEGO does offer a service where you can get broken bricks replaced for free. Sounds great, right? Well, there was a small hiccup. If you try to order too many replacement pieces at once, LEGO might cancel your request because they're worried that some people might try to cheat the system and get free bricks. I know, I know. That's a bummer for collectors who have tons of sets full of brittle brown pieces. Replacing them yourself is an option though, but it can get pricey and some older pieces aren't even made anymore with the new sturdier materials. So those will probably break again in the future, but at least they recognize the problem, right? In the same way, they recognized that they had to catch up with competitors, but ended up flopping big time. When LEGO tried to take on its competition with LEGO Xenap, things didn't go exactly as planned. Xenap was LEGO's answer to Kinex, using hollow parts to build big models quickly. But instead of getting the best of both worlds, Xenap ended up the worst. Kinex was known for creating things you couldn't make with LEGO, but Xenap, it mostly made things that could have been done better with regular LEGO bricks or Technic parts. Xenap had a decent variety of pieces, like long and angled beams, tiny connectors, or even giant wheels. But there was one big problem. These pieces weren't very versatile. For example, the largest beams only had six Xenap connection points, and while they had extra Technic connection spots, they were barely used in official sets. Another downside was the color-coded connectors. While Technic pins and axles were also color-coded, you can usually hide them in your build. But this wasn't quite possible with Xenap. Imagine making a cool red and black race car, only to have purple and gray pieces stick out like a sore thumb. Yikes. And to make things even more frustrating, Xenap parts didn't fit well into regular LEGO builds because they had only a few Technic connection points, and they weren't evenly spaced. On one hand, most of the sets looked pretty bad, but on the other hand, given the limited pieces, a few were surprisingly okay. Take the Super Constructor set, also called Ant for example, it actually looks like an ant, and when you roll it, the legs move. The colors are mostly red with a yellow belly and black legs. Though you'll still see patches of purple and gray, you could even rebuild it into a bird, a robot, or an attempt at a car. Then there's Jeep, which could have been awesome if the colors were better coordinated. It did try using yellow wheels for headlights and seats. Jeep came with a matching green trailer and a buggy with two cylinder engines. You could also turn Jeep into a boat, motorcycle, or, well, something that I can't quite figure out. But not all Xenap sets were winners. Take Jet Car and Bywing for example. They were pretty uninspired and the Jet Car only looked like a car because it had four wheels. The alternate models? They didn't resemble much of anything, real or imaginary. At the very bottom of the Xenap barrel, there's one set too weird to have been released, and that's set 3533. It might have been an attempt at a tribute to the classic LEGO duck, but honestly, I'll leave it up to you to decide what it was trying to be. The big issue with Xenap was that it was too focused too much on small sets with weak designs, and Instead of really going all in on large models. The kind of thing Xenap was supposed to be great at, out of the 20 Xenap sets released, 12 had fewer than 40 pieces. Some of the larger sets could have been motorized to create awesome moving cars, but that rarely happened. There was potential for even bigger builds, some promotional pictures showed models several feet tall. But getting enough parts for something like that was nearly impossible, as even the biggest Xenap sets had fewer than 300 pieces. Talk about a missed opportunity. And maybe the only set worse than LEGO Xenap is the LEGO Technic Fiber Optic set. The LEGO Fiber Optic set from 1996 was all about building cool machines that lit up with special cables called fiber optics. That sounds awesome, right? But there was some big problems. The lights weren't as bright as people hoped, and the set was really expensive to make. Plus, the cables were super easy to break, which made building frustrating. People expected a lot more fun, but it just didn't live up to the hype. In fact, it was such a failure that it even made it into a museum of failure. And apart from failing to make good toys that fit the narrative of TV shows, LEGO also failed to make good toys that fit the narrative of some popular games. One example is Minecraft. LEGO Minecraft made its debut in 2013, with a trio of mini sets, including the Inn. About a year later, they introduced the cooler minifigure scale models. I've never been a fan of those smaller sets, especially when most of the other ones are larger and more detailed. If LEGO does release a mini set, it should be awesome enough to stand on its own, like the fantastic Hogwarts castle. But the end? Yikes. It's a bit of a snooze fest, and not very exciting to look at, and it basically has no play value. 
only the most dedicated Minecraft fans might want it, but probably just to finish their collection. But what happens when LEGO tries launching both a theme set and a TV show at the same time? It was once a recipe for success, but was also a recipe for disaster. LEGO Legends of Chima was a theme and TV show that launched in 2013, and while it had some popularity, it ultimately didn't fare well compared to its most successful sibling, Ninjago. One of the biggest complaints was the storyline, which many find confusing and shallow. The premise of these animals battling over Chi felt too childish for some fans. Even reminiscent of shows on Disney Junior leading people to lose interest quickly. Some fans pointed out that the writing felt juvenile and that the characters, while visually interesting, lacked depth or compelling arcs. Another issue was that Chima seemed like a forced attempt to replicate the success of Ninjago, but it lacked the same charm and character development. While Ninjago balanced action and humor, Chima struggled to maintain the same excitement, leaving both its TV show and sets underwhelming for many. Some fans did enjoy the unique sets designed and a few of the characters especially in the later seasons, but by then the initial disappointment had already turned many away from the theme. Another mistake LEGO made was trying to overplease their toddler audience with the LEGO Primo set. LEGO's Duplo line has been a go-to toy for young children since its launch in 1975. Designed for toddlers aged 1 to 5, Duplo bricks are twice the size of regular LEGO pieces, making them easier and safer for small hands to handle. Duplo's goal has always been to introduce kids to the world of building while ensuring safety and fun. The Primo offshoot introduced in the 1990s was made for babies even younger than Duplo's target audience. Unlike Duplo bricks, Primo pieces were not compatible with standard Lego or Duplo bricks. However, the line didn't last, as it was succeeded by Lego Baby, which eventually phased out by 2005 due to its profitability issues. Lego found that catering to this niche market for very young children just wasn't sustainable for the long term. But what about Lego superhero sets? Have they made any mistakes with those? Well, if you didn't already know, Lego has produced some incredible Marvel sets over the years, featuring highly sought after minifigures. However, the Spider-Man theme in particular has delivered some peculiar and rather childlike sets. For example, Spider-Man has been given some really silly vehicles, including the Monster Truck, Spider Trike, and Techno Trike. One set that stands out is the Vulture's Truck Robbery, which includes a red and blue motorbike for Spider-Man. It's tough to see how a motorbike fits into Spider-Man's web-slinging lifestyle unless it's venturing outside of the skyscrapers of New York City. Unfortunately, this set doesn't redeem itself with its minifigures, which include a standard Spider-Man, a generic truck driver, and rather basic Vulture that closely resembles one released four years earlier. It's a forgettable set that doesn't offer much value, especially at a $21.50 per piece. And finally, there's this Lego Joker set. The set also suffers from a build style reminiscent of action figures, which feels completely out of place in the Lego universe. Its construction features many strange parts with limited reusability, making it one of the priciest sets in the entire DC theme, especially since many pieces are unique to this set, two other oversized sets, Batman and Green Lantern, also vie for the title of the worst LEGO DC set, further emphasizing the theme's struggle with these unusual designs. So maybe you agree with me that these are probably LEGO's biggest mistakes of all time. And maybe, just maybe, you'll like this video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on post notifications so you don't miss another awesome video like this.